Chapter four of your textbook is rather long, so we're going to break it up into two parts. Part one will cover sections 4.1 and 4.2. This is over different types of chemical reactions. There are many types of chemical reactions, but we're gonna focus on two major types in this class, which are double replacement reactions and single replacement reactions. And we'll talk about a few subcategories within each of those. All chemical reactions obey something known as the law of conservation of mass. This means that in a chemical reaction, matter or mass is neither created or destroyed. Your reactants only change forms into something new when they become products. So if, for example, we had the combustion of methane, and methane is CH4, and imagine the sum of our masses of our reactants was 15 grams, that would mean that the sum of the masses of our products would also be 15 grams because mass would neither be created or destroyed. It should never be lost in a chemical reaction. How we show this when writing chemical reactions is we balance our equations. We balance them using coefficients, which represent numbers out in front of certain species, such as the two out in front of the oxygen, or the two out in front of the water. We're trying to represent the same number and type of atoms on the reactant side as the same number and type of atoms on the product side. So notice we have one carbon atom on the left and one carbon atom on the right. We have a total of two times two or four oxygen atoms on the left hand side and we have two oxygen atoms here and two oxygen atoms here. So we have four oxygen atoms total on the right. Everything should work out to be the same and obey the law of conservation of mass when your equation is balanced. Balancing equations will take a little practice and there's no right or wrong way to go about doing it. The only thing we can change are those coefficients or numbers out in front of the different species within the chemical equation. We can never change the subscripts within a chemical formula in order to balance it. This is because if you start changing the subscripts, you're actually changing what the substances are. So we're gonna do a few practice problems in order to figure out what our balanced equations would be. Zinc metal reacts with hydrochloric acid to produce aqueous zinc two chloride and hydrogen gas. So first we need to convert this into the chemical formulas. So zinc metal would be solid zinc. It's reacting with hydrochloric acid, which is HCl, and it's aqueous. We're producing zinc 2 chloride, ZnCl2, which will be aqueous as well, and hydrogen gas. Hydrogen is one of our elements that occurs naturally as a diatomic molecule, so you want to be sure to write H2 for hydrogen. Now we're gonna place our coefficients in order to balance this. Notice on the right-hand side, the product side, we have two hydrogens. So we can put a two out in front of our HCl. On the left-hand side, we have one zinc, and we also have one zinc on the right-hand side. This two that we wrote out in front of our hydrogen applies to the hydrogen, and it also applies to the chlorine. So we have two chlorines on the left-hand side, and we also have two chlorines on the right. Everything is balanced. We don't have to put ones out in front. They're just assumed to be there. Let's try another one. Sodium hydroxide and phosphoric acid react as aqueous solutions to give sodium phosphate in water. Write the balanced equation. The formula for sodium hydroxide is NaOH, and it's an aqueous solution. plus it's reacting with phosphoric acid. The formula is H3PO4, and that's aqueous as well. Our products we're forming are sodium phosphate. The formula for sodium phosphate is Na3PO4. That'll be an aqueous product, and we're forming water, H2O. 
and water is a pure liquid, so we'll put a subscript L after it. Now we've converted into our chemical formulas. Next for balancing, we want to check. Notice we have three sodium atoms on the product side, and right now we only have one sodium on the reactant side, so we're going to throw a three out in front here. I like to balance polyatomic ions as a unit. We have one phosphate unit on the left, and we have one phosphate unit on the right. This three distributes to the sodium, the oxygen, and the hydrogen. So our total on the left is going to be six hydrogens currently. And right now on the product side, we only have two hydrogens. So if we put a three out in front, we'll have three hydrogens, or six hydrogens. So we'll have three times two or six, and then three oxygens. So we have three oxygens on the left, and we also have three oxygen atoms on the right-hand side. So we checked everything, and it appears to be balanced. So our coefficients are three, one, one, and three. Balancing equations is a lot of guess and check. You might start somewhere and see if it works out. Here are some tips. Start with the most complicated formula first. Leave uncombined elements to the end. So for example, if you have hydrogen or oxygen, since they're not chemically combined with anything else, it'd be best to wait till the very end to balance them. Balance polyatomic ions as a group if they appear unchanged on both sides of the arrow. Let's try another example. This equation represents the combustion of hexane, which is a hydrocarbon. So if we start balancing this, notice the most complicated substance is going to be the hexane, which is C6H14. There's six carbons on the left-hand side, so we're going to put six carbons on the right-hand side out in front of CO2. There is 14 hydrogens on the left-hand side, and right now there's only two on the right, so we could put a seven out in front of our hydrogen. Now if we take a total, what are our number of oxygens that we have? We have six times two, or 12 oxygens, plus we have seven oxygens here, so we have a total of 19 oxygen atoms on the right. Right now we only have two oxygen atoms on the reactant side. But there's nothing that we can put out in front of our O2 that will be able to multiply by 2 and give us 19. So another trick when you're dealing with combustion formulas is to write a fraction. So C6H14 plus 19 halves O2 gives us 6CO2 plus 7H2O. Now we can't leave our formula like that. We can't leave fractions in there. But now we could think about what we're going to multiply everything through by to get rid of our fraction. Notice we have a 2 in the denominator. So if we multiply a 2 through to all of our species, that'll cancel out the 2 in the denominator of our fraction. So our balanced equation will be 2C6H14 plus 19O2 gives us 12CO2 plus 14H2O. So using fractions is a trick when you get to a point where you have an odd number that you need to multiply by something and you can't get it to work out. Usually you'll have a diatomic element such as O2, H2, Cl2, Use a fraction and then figure out what you need to multiply through by to get rid of that fraction. The major goal for the first half of chapter four is going to be writing different types of chemical reactions. Double replacement reactions will come in two major types. Solids, which are called precipitates being formed, and acid-based neutralizations. And then later, we'll look at single replacement reactions, specifically oxidation reduction reactions. There are other types of chemical reactions that are not in your textbook, and we'll see a few of those in lab. For example, there's gas forming reactions, combination reactions, and decomposition reactions. 
First, we're going to start with focusing on double replacement reactions. We'll learn how to write the products for precipitation reactions and determine if a precipitate is forming in the first place. And then next, we'll learn how to write the products for acid-base neutralization reactions. A double replacement reaction is one that occurs in solution where cations and anions change partners. So this means we have some ionic solid dissolved in water to give us a solution for both of our reactants. Notice A represents a cation and X represents a cation. B would represent an anion and Y would represent an anion. That means when we do our double replacement and we form our products, cation A pairs up with anion Y to give us a new product AY. And cation X pairs up with anion B to give us our other new product, XB. We always write our cation followed by our anion when writing our new formulas. We also have to be sure to write correct formulas and not just copy down the number of subscripts that we see on the left. When we form our new products from our double replacement reaction, one of two things will occur. If we form a precipitate, that's going to be one type of a reaction. If we have a salt and water formed, that would be the result of an acid-base neutralization. A precipitation reaction is one where a precipitate, which is another word for an insoluble solid, is formed. If you form a precipitate in solution, it might appear milky or opaque or cloudy. If it's left to settle long enough, it'll set to the bottom where it could be filtered off and dried. If you've ever heard of hard water, hard water could contain metal ions such as calcium or magnesium. These ions can lead to a precipitate being formed in the shower known as soap scum. Let's examine what's happening on the molecular level during a precipitation reaction. Notice on the left we have two clear colorless solutions, lead to nitrate and potassium iodide. If we take those ionic salts and we dissolve them in water, they'll break apart into their respective ions. So in the lead to nitrate solution, we really have a bunch of separate lead ions swimming around and a bunch of separate nitrate ions swimming around. None of them are combined together. Same thing with the potassium iodide solution. We have a bunch of separate potassium ions swimming around and a bunch of separate iodide ions swimming around. Reactions are often carried out in aqueous solutions because it's easier for things to be mixed together. If we mix them, now the ions can intermingle and the new products can be formed. When we change partners and exchange cations and anions, we'll form one new product, which is lead to iodide. Notice this is a solid, so we use our states of matter listed after it, and solid we represent with an S. Our other product, which is the potassium nitrate, is aqueous. Aqueous tells us that it's actually still broken up into its ions, and those ions are surrounded by water. So the term aqueous means in water. Our solid represents our precipitate that was formed. So if we formed a solid, that would be our solid in our insoluble precipitate. So if we look at this, the lead to iodide is actually a yellow solid, and that will settle out to the bottom. So that's this clump that we see here of lead ions packed tightly with iodide anions. This is our precipitate in solution. It stays together since it's a solid. We also have our potassium ions swimming around freely and we have our nitrate anions swimming around freely. That's because they are soluble in water, so they're broken up into their respective ions. Next, we're gonna learn how to predict the products and the states of matter from our double replacement reactions. If we are going to determine if a precipitate or a solid will be formed in the first place, we have to use something called the solubility rules. You have a handout that's titled 
solubility rules for ionic compounds in water. You do not need to memorize these as they will be provided on a quiz or exam, but you do have to know how to use them. So let's look through them. Number one, under soluble compounds, all compounds of the alkali metals, which are group 1A, are soluble. That means anything with a sodium ion, a potassium ion, a cesium ion, anything from group 1A will be soluble. Any salts containing the ammonium ion, the nitrate ion, the perchlorate ion, chlorate ion, and acetate anion are soluble. No exceptions. Number three, all chlorides, bromides, and iodides are soluble except if they're combined with silver, lead 2 plus, or mercury 1. We didn't really talk about the mercury ion in this class, so don't worry about that too much. Number four, all sulfates are soluble except those of lead, calcium, strontium, mercury, and barium. So those are going to tell you what's soluble, except for the few exceptions. Now the next part tells us mostly what's insoluble, meaning what will form our precipitate. Number five, all metal hydroxides and all metal oxides are insoluble, except if they're paired up with a group 1A metal or calcium, strontium, or barium. And number six, all salts that contain phosphate, carbonate, sulfite, and sulfide are insoluble, except if they're paired with a group 1A metal or ammonium ion. So we're gonna practice using these rules to determine if a given ionic compound is going to be aqueous, which means it would be soluble in water, or if it's going to be solid, which means it would form a precipitate. It's probably best to keep your handout with the solubility rules next to you for the remainder of this chapter. Let's practice classifying the following compounds as soluble or insoluble in water. Lead to chloride. So normally chlorides are soluble, but there's an exception for if they're paired with lead. So that would be an insoluble compound. Potassium carbonate, all alkali metals, group 1A, are soluble. And so since that has the potassium ion in it, it will be soluble. Silver nitrate. All nitrates are soluble, and there are no exceptions, so this is going to be soluble. Iron 3 hydroxide. Hydroxides are typically insoluble, and it's not iron is not a group 1A or the group 2A metals that are listed, so iron 3 hydroxide will be insoluble. Magnesium bromide. All bromides are soluble, and magnesium is not an exception. Ammonium phosphate. Phosphates are typically insoluble, but there's an exception if they're group, with group 1A or ammonium, so that will be soluble. And calcium carbonate. Carbonates are typically insoluble, and calcium is not an exception to that rule, so calcium carbonate would be a precipitate that would form. So that's how we use the solubility rules to figure out if something is going to be a solid precipitate or if it's going to be aqueous in solution, which means that it's soluble and will dissolve and break up into its respective ions when it's in water. Next, we're going to learn how to write three different types of equations for our double replacement reactions. First is the molecular equation. This represents the full chemical equation. Everything is presented as if it was molecules for the ionic compounds in solution. So we're looking at everything like it's combined together. The ionic equation, we will break all of the soluble species that are aqueous into their ions to show what's really going on in solution. And lastly, the net ionic equation is where we cancel out something called spectator ions, which are only watching the reaction and not participating. And we're only looking at what's really changing in the chemical reaction when we look at a net ionic equation. The steps to follow 
include predicting the products using the double replacement method of exchanging cations and anions, so they're with their new partners, using the solubility rules to determine if your products that you formed are going to be aqueous in solution or if you formed a solid precipitate. You're going to want to balance your chemical equation using coefficients out front. Break up any soluble compounds into their ions when writing the ionic equation. And then cancel out spectator ions that are the same on the left and right hand side of the arrow when going to the net ionic equation. So let's give this a try. Write the molecular ionic and net ionic equations for the reaction between zinc 2 nitrate and calcium hydroxide. So when we're writing the molecular equation, we're going to write everything as if it's together, even though in solution it's really not. So zinc 2 nitrate will leave some room for balancing, plus calcium hydroxide. Both of those are going to be aqueous solutions, so we can write AQ after them. And forming our products, now when we do our double replacement, our zinc cation will pair up with our hydroxide anion in the other compound, and our calcium cation will pair up with our nitrate anion. So our two new products are going to be zinc 2 hydroxide. So we have to write a correct formula for that, ZnOH2, plus we're going to form some calcium nitrate. And since calcium is a plus 2 and nitrate is a minus 1, that'll be CaNO3 parenthesis 2. And now in terms of balancing, if we check everything on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, it looks like everything is already balanced and going to be in a 1 to 1 to 1 to 1 ratio. Next, we want to use the solubility rules to figure out what is going to be aqueous and what's going to be solid in our products that we formed. So rule number two says that all nitrates are soluble, all salts containing nitrate, so that means our calcium nitrate will be soluble, so we'll put aqueous after it. And rule number five says that metal hydroxides are insoluble. And zinc's not an exception, so our zinc 2 hydroxide will be our precipitate that we form. So since it's a precipitate, that's why we put a subscript S after it to represent that it's a solid. Next, when we write our ionic equation, we want to break up all soluble species into their ions. So our zinc 2 nitrate on our reactant side was aqueous, so that means it's going to break up into zinc 2 plus ions. And we're going to get nitrate ions as well, NO3 minus. And notice we have a subscript of 2 after the nitrate. That tells us we get two nitrate ions when the zinc 2 nitrate dissociates in water. Dissociate means that it breaks up into its respective ions. When calcium hydroxide dissociates, that's also aqueous, we'll get calcium ions and we'll get two hydroxide anions. That takes care of our reactant side. Going to our product side. One of our new products we formed was our zinc 2 hydroxide, but that's not soluble. That's our precipitate that we formed. And so since it's a precipitate, we're not going to break it up into its ions because it's not swimming around as ions in solution. So we don't want to break this apart. But our other product, which was calcium nitrate, is soluble. So we're going to break that up into calcium ions, and we'll get two nitrate ions when it dissociates. When we move from the, net ion, the ionic reaction to the net ionic reaction, we want to focus on what's really happening, what's really changing. So we cancel out something called spectator ions, which those are going to be species that are the same on the left-hand side of the arrow and the right-hand side of the arrow. 
For example, calcium two ions are present with the same coefficient on the left and the right. So those represent spectator ions, as well as our two nitrate ions. Those are on the left and the right hand side. So our spectator ions, they really are present in solution, but they're not participating in the reaction. They're not changing to form something new. So our net ionic reaction is what we're left with, which is zinc 2 plus plus our hydroxide 2OH minus, giving us ZnOH2 or zinc 2 hydroxide, which is our solid precipitate that we formed. It's important when you're moving from the molecular equation to the ionic equation that you're actually writing your ions. So it's important to have the correct charges on your species when they're dissociated and the correct coefficients out front based upon how many of each ion there is in solution. Let's try another one. We're going to write the molecular ionic and anionic equations for the reaction when two aqueous solutions of lead 2 nitrate and iron 3 sulfate are mixed. So starting with our molecular equation, we're going to have lead nitrate, PbNO3 2, and that's an aqueous solution plus it's going to react with iron 3 sulfate that's also an aqueous solution and when we do our double replacement we're going to form our new products so we're going to pair up our iron cation with our nitrate anion and that'll give us fe no3 with a three on the outside because nitrate is a minus one and iron is a plus three. And we're going to get for our other double replacement product, some lead sulfate. Lead is a plus two and sulfate is a minus two. So our formula is PBSO4. Our states of matter of our new products, we have to predict those using our solubility rules. Our iron nitrate should be soluble, so we'll put aqueous after it. And our lead sulfate should be insoluble, so that's gonna be our solid that forms, which is our precipitate in solution. Next, we have to balance our reaction. In order to balance this, notice we have different numbers of our polyatomic ions from left to right. For example, we have two irons on the left, so we can throw a two out in front on the right. We have two times three or six nitrate ions now on the right hand side. So we can put a three out in front here to get six nitrate ions on the left. That gives us three lead ions, and so we'll need three lead ions on the right. And if we check sulfate, we have three sulfates on the right and three sulfates on the left. So everything is balanced now. Now moving from the molecular equation to the ionic equation, we're going to break up anything that is soluble into its ions, looking at the coefficients out front and the subscripts out back. So for example, when lead 2 nitrate dissociates into its ions, we're going to get three lead ions, so three Pb2+, plus, plus we're going to get six nitrate anions. For our iron 3 sulfate, we're going to get two iron ions, three plus charge, plus we're going to get three sulfate anions, SO4 2 minus. On our product side, our iron 3 nitrate, we're going to get two iron ions, plus we're going to get six nitrate ions. And then lastly, our precipitate that we formed, our lead 2 sulfate, 
we're going to keep together and not break apart because that's a solid that formed in solution. Lastly, writing our net ionic equation. Find your spectator ions. Notice there's two iron ions on the left and the right. Those will cancel. And there's also six nitrate ions on the left and on the right. Those will cancel as well. What we're left with here are three lead two plus ions combining with three sulfate anions gives us our precipitate, which is our lead two sulfate that we formed. At the end of the day, if you don't form a precipitate, both of your products would be aqueous and everything in your ionic equation would cancel out and you really would have no reaction because you would have nothing left in your net ionic equation. In order to have a reaction, one thing that has to occur for now is we have to form that precipitate. That's one way we know a chemical change happened. Let's try this last example. Predict whether a reaction will occur when aqueous solutions of copper two bromide and sodium carbonate are mixed together. Write the molecular ionic and net ionic equations. Starting with our molecular equation first, we have our copper two bromide, which is an aqueous solution, plus we're reacting it with our sodium carbonate, which is an aqueous solution. When we undergo our double replacement, our sodium cation will pair up with our bromide anion. The formula, since sodium is a plus one and bromide is a minus one, will be NaBr. Our other product that we'll form will come from our copper two ion coming together with our carbonate anion. Copper is a plus two and carbonate is a minus two, so this will be CuCO3. Predicting our states of matter, sodium bromide, sodium is a soluble ion and bromide is a soluble ion, so that'll be aqueous. And copper carbonate, carbonates are typically insoluble, so this is going to be a solid precipitate that we form. Next, we have to balance our reaction. We have two sodiums on the left and one on the right, so we're gonna put a two out in front of our sodium bromide, and then that takes care of our two bromides on the left, and now we have two on the right as well. Everything else is happy or has a coefficient of one out in front. Remember, you don't have to write the one if you don't want to. Going from our molecular equation to our ionic, we're going to break up our soluble species into their ions. So we're going to get copper two plus ion. And when copper two bromide dissociates, we get one copper two plus, but we get two bromide anions. When our sodium carbonate dissociates, we'll get two sodium ions, plus we'll get one carbonate polyatomic ion. Going to our products, we're gonna get two sodium ions and two bromide anions from our sodium bromide dissociating. And then our other product is our precipitate, so we're not gonna break that up because that remains as a solid in solution. Our spectator ions in this reaction are going to be our bromides, our two bromide anions will cancel, and our two sodium ions will cancel. The same on the left and the right hand side. Our net ionic equation is going to be our copper two plus ions combining with our carbonate anions to form our solid copper carbonate precipitate.